<coughs> okay, so I'll start having uh, my camera. And you can start. Right, so hello everybody. Welcome to the 15th talk regarding this IAPS at a distance. With us today, we have doctors Manuel Prieto and Anthony Wall from the international, um, <laughs> from the international Union of Pure and Applied Biophysics. And they're going to talk to us about biophysics. Start, sir. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, on behalf of uh, the IUPAB Executive Committee and all IUPAB, uh, we would like just to thank you, the Association of Physics Students, for this kind invitation. It's really a great pleasure just to us uh, uh, to talk about uh, what's going on on physics applied to biological systems, which is in fact biophysics. So also we have a collaboration of a long time uh, friend of IUPAB, Professor Anthony Watts, Tony Watts, later we'll, I will come back about him. And uh, he uh, is going to first to, to let you know a beautiful guided visit, uh, guided visit to what is biophysics. Then I will come just telling you very short comment about uh, IUPAB and also some invitation for the physics, for the students of physics, and later we'll describe some uh, specific applications in our areas. So, once again, thank you so much, uh, Association of Physics students. Please, Tony. <laughs> thank you, Manuel, and thank you, Esther and Duarte, for this very kind invitation. Um, my name is Tony Watts. I'm speaking to you from Oxford in the UK. And what I'm going to do now is share my screen with you and give a short presentation on a definition and a description of what biophysics is. So here we go. <clears throat> so what is biophysics? Biophysics is the bridging science, um, often referred to um, as a science and discipline which links physics and the methods and theories of physics are applied to understand how biology, biological systems work. And how does that happen? Well, um, it happens through the application of many physical principles to living systems. And biophysics over the years has given us many innovations. For example, magnetic resonance imaging, CAT, PET scans and ultrasonics as well as microscopy and spectroscopy. And these use the physical principles of the electromagnetic spectrum and the interaction with matter, and in particular, magnetism. One driving area and major area of biophysics has been the determination of molecular structure. And I'm showing here some biological molecules that have been derived using physical principles. And in my second talk, I will tell you how this is done. You will know about DNA, the genetic information in the cell, many proteins, for example, and also membranes that uh, encl enclose a, a biological cell. Biophysics has also given us uh, computer modeling and data analysis. And currently, neural networks are a very active area, understanding communication within the brain, for example. And that's also helping us to understand how to build communication systems for ourselves. Uh, biomolecular motion is very important as well. For example, here is a protein within a membrane, and you can see the membrane and the protein is moving quite significantly. So we should keep motion in mind. It doesn't move, it often doesn't do anything. So motion is very important. And for all of this, we're using theoretical physics together with experimental biology and often numerical analysis for example, a simulation of this kind of uh, um, system uses classical mechanics, classical Newton mechanics, in fact, to understand the motion of atoms within these molecules. 
Also, we have electrical impulses within our bodies. These can be analyzed and measured and detected. And indeed in devices, they can be manipulated so that we can control the heart through such devices. And uh, medical biophysics is a very active area of uh, the, the field. Um, pacemakers and so on, and rheolo rheology and how blood flow in the body is something that we need to measure and understand and describe in quantitative terms. Bionanotechnology and biomaterials, biomechanics is also very actively uh, uh, followed, in particular where we want to understand prosthetic li limbs or uh, and for example, the mechanics of such a junction with the body and how the materials can survive the stresses and strains of uh, prosthetic uh, limbs is, is one area where physics is making a, a, a big impact and understanding how to make these much more efficient. And um, nanotechnology, bionanotechnology with small particles which you can inject into the body and we can deliver drugs, for example, chemotherapy drugs are delivered in such particles. Uh, and the thermodynamics and the stability of these kinds of uh, uh, molecules, which are often lipid molecules, you'll hear more about those later, are really very important indeed. We often have to model these and we use molecular modeling techniques for doing that. Um, a recent biophysical innovation is uh, in this protein nanotube at the bottom here. This is actually a protein. And through this protein, we can send DNA, the genetic information, from any source we want to. And in fact, you can sequence the DNA from the impulses, the electrical impulses that we measured as this DNA goes through the protein pore. And at this moment, this is being used to look at the genomes of COVID viruses. And the company that has been driving this technology is called Oxford Nanopore. And it's the first company uh, from innovation that was floated on the stock market at a billion dollars. So you can see the value of this kind of technology coming from basic biophysical science right through into this kind of detection device. Environmental biophysics is becoming very important at the moment. In particular, uh, if we are going to look at bioreactors, there's quantum biology going on here. We need to know the quantum yield for photon capture by biological materials such as algae or plants and how those get then transferred into uh, bioproducts such as jet fuel or as uh, livestock feed and so on that might come out of a bioreactor. This is an interesting detection over the city of Sydney in Australia looking at nitrous oxide emissions during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is from March and this is from April. And you can see that the detection from space using detectors of nitrous oxide show a big decrease in the amount of nitrous oxide being uh, emitted from, from the city. And here, analyzing outputs and the data from space is very important uh, in terms of how that is done. And then I saw this on the inter internet, a diver's favorite uh, friend is, is physics because the laws of physics in particular thermodynamics, Charles Law, Henry's Law, and so on, the kind of things we learn as students, are vital for being able to survive as we dive down, particularly into the uh, into ocean vents and understand the gases that are coming out from here. So this is uh, quite an interesting uh, idea. There's a big web page on um, how uh, physicists are the friend of divers. So, Put together, there's a lot of inventions, a lot of innovations, a lot of technology. It affects all of our lives, these kind of basic biophysics uh, um, uh, science. How did biophysics arise? It's not chemistry, it's not physics, it's not math, it's not biology, it's a combination of sciences. It started in 1847 by a so-called gang of four. These were students, they were um, researchers who were students of a particular physician, and they were all medical students to start with. They rejected the idea that living systems depend on special biological laws. And they said that they wouldn't differ from those in the ordinary area of science. In other words, biology should obey the laws of physics. And that's exactly what they tried to prove. The missing link between biology and physics was suggested to be biophysics in 1892, so it's not a new name. 
Erwin Schrödinger, many of you may have heard of his famous lectures, What is Life? And then really this started to take off in an experimental way with a biophysics research unit set up by Morris Wilkins, who won the Nobel Prize, of course, who hired physics, physicists to work on questions of biological significance. Some people who were in that institute at the time, Rosalind Franklin, for example, here she is, and also Francis Crick, who was visiting from Cambridge, and also James Watson from the USA, they resolved the structure of the double helix, which is here, the genetic information which is in all living systems. And that came from this diffraction pattern, a fiber diffraction pattern, and that diagonal that you see here, something I actually worked on as a student in biophysics, allows you to detect, to understand the molecular structure of the DNA, and then the base pairing. And for that, uh, Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize. Sadly, Rosalind Franklin was left out. In 1981, the International Union of Pure and Applied Biophysics, on behalf of whom Manuel and I are speaking, was founded in Stockholm. And now there are over 80 biophysical societies worldwide. Contemporary biophysics, the basic science that goes on now, includes a lot of molecular dynamics. This is some coarse grain dynamics, molecular dynamics, showing the interaction top typically uh, and uh, top topically at the moment of a virus with a mammalian cell. We can understand that each of these individual components, as computers get more powerful, we can simulate them, interact with the plasma membrane. And then here, this is one of my students at a free electron laser facility in Japan, where we're firing lasers at crystals as they go into the synchrotron to resolve uh, conformational studies in proteins or changes in proteins at the femtosecond to millisecond time range. So we can now look at these motions directly within crystals after we change them in some way. And there are only two or three places in the world where you can do that kind of work. But that's a new innovation. And then um, we also can put together many crystal structures to understand, in this case, for example, how some proteins will walk along the scaffold which holds our cells together. And individual protein structures are now put together and we can model them in, in, in this way. So the crystallography and the structural biology is very important here. And then here is another simulation, and you'll hear from Manuel later about ion channels, about how sodium ions can go through a channel. And that involves a lot of uh, complicated uh, quantum biology and quantum physics to understand the forces involved between the protein and the ions themselves. So these are contemporary methods. We also can do whole organ, whole body uh, simulations. Here we have a systems model for circulation. We can model the electrical impulses in the heart, for example. It's that that help us with heart lung, with um, uh, pacemaker device construction and so on. And all of this is driven by ion channels. You'll hear more later, as I say. And we can look at the electrical impulses in a whole cell. And we can do single molecule observation, for example, and put this together in a systems way so we understand the whole system. Indeed, you'll hear more about fluorescence later from Manuel. Here is a, a, an outline of a cell, and here tracking in real time is a molecule, a single molecule being tracked through, the, through a cell. So we can actually see single molecules through the cell, and that uses uh, optical and mathematical analysis, of course. And then finally, we can see bacteria moving around through fluorescence methods. We can visualize the tail of the bacterium. You can see its helical. And then we can build models from the individual proteins. We know that to show how they uh, rotate within a stator. This is a molecular motor. There are stators as an armature. They're running round and round. They're being driven by the ATP molecules uh, in, in a cell. So this is contemporary biophysics, single molecule, whole systems biophysics. And in fact, biophysics is a continually developing science. Nobel prizes for biophysics are tremendous. There's a huge number there. Some of them go back uh, some long way. Uh, others are much more contemporary, but on a regular basis, these people, they come to the biophysics congresses, Stefan Hell, for example, uh, and Michael Levitt, and these are Nobel prize winners who've won for um, different areas of biophysics, Steve Chu for optical tweezers, for example, um, and uh, many more. 
So for you as physics students, where might you find either a bachelor's, a master's or a PhD in biophysics? So the Biophysical Society has this map. It's not complete because I know of biophysics opportunities in South America, for example, but there are resources around where people can look to see where biophysics is going on. It's going on in a lot more locations than just shown there for those authenticated biophysics degree programs. So if you wanted to um, find a PhD in biophysics, for example, there is a site called findaphd.com and biophysics is listed within that website. You could join a biophysical society. As I say, there are 80 of these worldwide. They're all over the world. And there are about 20,000 members associated with these societies at the moment. Go to biophysics congresses and workshops. There are many of those run. Some of these are run by IUPAV and other organizations. One can subscribe to a news group. For example, there's one here from the European Biophysical Societies. And there are often opportunities for PhDs and postdocs. Clearly read journals and papers. And many biophysics papers uh, appear in very high profile and high impact journals. And the IUPAB, the International Union, has its own journal of reviews, which give a good overview, contemporary overview, to various areas of science. So um, the majority of biophysicists, I have to say, do start life in other sciences. That's the case for Manuel, who we hear from later. I studied one of the more unusual biophysics degrees as an undergraduate in the 60s, but they come in from chemistry, physics, maths, and biochemistry as well. And most biochemistry departments and chemistry will have biophysicists in them. So um, what might you typically do if you were a biophysics PhD student? Well, you might, you would read, join a lab, you'd read around the theme of research in the lab, and then you might do any one of the following things. You might prepare some biological material, for example, a protein, a membrane, some DNA, or a cell. You would prepare that material for experiments, such as crystallizing it or labeling it. You would make some physical related measurements, such as X ray diffraction, microscopy, magnetic resonance, fluorescence. Analyze quantitatively the data using computational methods, especially the huge data sets which are now being produced from many biophysical methods. You would construct a model for your system and explain how it functions. You test the model using computer simulations. You might then make an animation, as I showed you earlier. Go to a conference, present your work in a poster or an oral presentation and get some feedback from other experts. And then you might write up the work for publication and a thesis. So that's typically what you might do. You might do one or more of those things more often. So that's my view of biophysics. And I I think I've incorporated most areas. I'd like to thank all of these people uh, for their, uh, and these websites for the images. And thank you very much. Okay. Over to you, Esther. Sorry, I didn't have the audio on. I was thanking you for this quick introduction into biophysics, which I think was very useful. And now we're on to Professor Prieto telling about what IUPAB, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, is and its activities and purpose. Yes, can you hear me? Are you listening right now? I think you're on mute, Manuel. Yes. Um. Okay, so thanks to stay and uh, moment. Just uh, disappeared here. I'm so sorry in a moment.
Okay. Sorry for this small delay. It's okay for everybody. Uh, are you seeing it? Sorry, it's there. Yes. There? Okay. So uh, this will be very br uh, brief words about uh, IUPAP, the International Union of Grand Applied Biophysics. Certainly, I will go very quickly. And uh, uh, then I will make some kind of invitation to students. Briefly, IUPAB is the federation at the world level of the organizations in biophysics. There are about around 60 uh, and discover 61 countries. So uh, rough calculation, it means that uh, there is about 12,000 people involved. So it's already a large community. Not surprising, the main uh, during bodies, they would be the National Biophysics Societies in most in addition to the National Biophysical Societies, also research councils of some countries and also Academy of Sciences. In addition, there are three regional organizations of biophysics, which are affiliated to IUPAP, one in Asia, the European Biophysics Association, which is very active. Tony Watts is the past president and also uh, the Latin American Federation of Biophysical Societies. And IUPAV is, uh, uh, is really strong also in Latin America. Science Council. The International Science Council is the umbrella organization for uh, most of the international scientific unions and associations. And uh, so we are coordinated at the top within this organization. And for you to be in perspective, the, the sister organizations of IUPAC, they are the International Union of, of Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC, which is a very strong society. And you are all, most of you, you are familiar also with the sister organization for physics, uh, the, for pure and applied physics, the IUPAC. We, IUPAC, we have already some connections with IUPAC and uh, another ones about mathematics, biological sciences, etc. Also, I should say that this designation, pure and applied, is typical from the 60s. No longer is very fashionable. You don't, uh, by now, we don't make much difference between pure and applied, but certainly is kept for historical reasons. The mission statement of IOPAB is coordinate and support research and teaching in the area of biophysics. And we have uh, a very large Congress, which is held every three years, and certainly we support conferences, schools, and workshops. There are three task forces, one in education and capacity building. The test is very dense, I will just uh, mention that uh, the aims of this uh, uh, task force is organized workshops and with a very strong emphasis in developing countries. In fact, the convener is from uh, South Africa. Already I told you that uh, IOPAB is strong in Latin America. And so this deals with organization of uh, conferences, meetings for students, uh, disseminate information, etc. Another one is around structural biology. Uh, this task force is remain is specific to the field that uh, Tony Watts will uh, address you after, which is the structural biology centered in X-ray diffraction, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, and electron microscopy. Certainly, and again, the aims they would be also to promote uh, meetings and conferences within uh, uh, this area. Again, paying attention to the developing countries. And this is a very new one. This is, this is some task force uh, on the use of uh, big data in biophysics, which coming up very strongly. Uh, this uh, uh, very new task force uh, was uh, made uh, uh, in the framework of CODATA, which is the committee on data of the International Council of Science that I told you about. And well, this is to deal with open data, open sciences, data science, uh, uh, and everything also to relates to publication and uh, which is really some uh, concern in this moment about science, open science and uh, uh, policies for publication. 
they will have next congresses. Well, uh, as you uh, likely can imagine, one in 2020 was postponed to 2021. This will be the large uh, Congress of IOPAV and will be near the Iguazu Falls in Brazil, so near the border of Brazil, Argentina uh, and uh, Paraguay. The place is beautiful and uh, there will be a terrific science there. It was postponed to one year, to next year, October. And uh, the next Congress, which was uh, uh, previously uh, considered for 2023 was also already postponed one year and will be organized by the Biophysical Society at Japan uh, and will be held at Kyoto. Also, YOPAV uh, uh, supports FOCUS, the so-called FOCUS meetings. Next one, and let's hope that uh, they will be held, certainly. Uh, it will be at Hyderabad in India in 2021 about structure on biology with some focus on cryo-electron microscopy. And the second one in Ottawa in Canada, this is related to ion channels and from structure to drug discovery. Uh, recently, also IOPAB has started up uh, prizes. There are two prizes awarded by IOPAB. One is in collaboration with Avanti Polar Lipids, and this IOPAP prize is for uh, outstanding contributions uh, for a researcher without limit of age, so certainly for a senior researcher. And there is also a Young Investigators Prize with the very same aim. Here, the Young Investigator is defined as uh, up to 12 years from the PhD. And it was a great pleasure since somebody you just met a moment ago, Anthony Watts from the University of Oxford, he was awarded of the, the Avanti Polar Lipids uh, IOPA Prize and with no surprise within the biophysics community. And the Younger Investigator Prize uh, uh, was to Hayawaf Shetman from the Technion uh, in Israel. Uh, the prizes they will be uh, in, uh, in fact awarded uh, in public next year at uh, the Congress uh, at the Iguazu Falls. And now, uh, this would be some invitation or proposal to uh, your society, to the physics students. So briefly, uh, the, you, uh, all the physics students, they can register at IOPAP for free and become member of the biophysical community. And you'll get information about fundings, activities, etc. Also, the very same with the newsletters from EPSA. Also, IUPAV, uh, the International Union of Grand Applied Biophysics, we would like to be one of the partners of the Association of Physics Students. You have some other societies there, such as IUPAP in Physics. And for this purpose, uh, we are going to address certainly the Executive Committee of uh, uh, APS of your society. But it's a pleasure just to make this open invitation Another one is physics students, if you'd like, within the framework of the Association of Physics Students, you'd like to start up some kind of working group, chapter, whatever we can call it, focused on biophysics, IOPA would be very glad to help. And on the very same, if you'd like to organize a series of webinars by the physics students which are involved in biophysics, IUPAB also would be very glad to support it with the prize for the best presentation. And thanks for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Professor Prieto. And thank you very much for that proposal. It is really indeed interesting. So moving on with today's schedule, we now it's the turn of both of you to talk about about um, about some biophysical methodologies. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will start off by talking about structural biophysics, which is uh, a major area of biophysics, and um, give you some examples of the power of biophysics in understanding how biology works. So structural biology is a branch of biophysics. 
it's the study of how molecules in living systems acquire the structures they do, but also importantly, we need to understand how they work. These are some uh, fairly standard uh, structural motifs that we find in many proteins in living systems, alpha helices um, and beta sheets, but also we see structures in nucleic acids. I showed you this one earlier, and maybe the, this clover leaf from a ribonucleic acid, RNA, and understand how that works in a cell. So all this comes from structural studies, <clears throat> and I'll go through some of the methods of how they do it. So in my first presentation, I showed you that molecular structure and dynamics for these molecules comes from spectroscopy and microscopy. So the physical principles involved here, as I said, is the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter and from magnetism. So here is the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, we're looking at quantum physics here. We're looking at the energy spectrum and the wavelength spectrum at the top here. And I'm going to be talking about radiation in the X-ray region here. This is mildly ionizing radiation and the wavelength here of the radiation is typically the order of 0.1 of a nanometer or a few uh, angstroms. And then I will also talk about radio waves in particular uh, for nuclear magnetic resonance and here we normally talk in terms of the frequency uh, which is typically in the megahertz time range but of course this has an energy as well. And then in the next talk Manuel will talk about um, radiation in the visible uh, range. So um, the principles in exploit, exploited in all of this structural biology really depend on the spatial resolution that is required. Usually uh, around the 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 9 meters, that's nanometers to millimeters, and the biological material being examined these are proteins, DNA, cells, and membranes. For molecular and atomic dynamics, the time scale to be determined is usually in the minutes to femtosecond time range. And as I said earlier, proteins and molecules, biomolecules, have lots of not only intramolecular motion moving around within themselves, but also intermolecular motion in terms of diffusional rates, as you will hear next. So the 25 common elements that make up all living things are predominantly oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And here are their masses. Of course, oxygen and hydrogen make up water and most living systems have a very high proportion of water. Some minor elements are actually vital for life. So iron, for example, is very important in producing electrical signals but it's only 0.004% of animal mass. So these atoms, they make up the four molecules of life. They are polymers, that is that there's a sequence of very similar individual molecules linked together and then folded into this determined, defined structure that we're going to determine. Proteins are made up of about 21 amino acids. Carbohydrates are made up of a large number of different types of individual monosaccharides or sugars. Then disaccharides, you'll, um, you'll remember uh, or know about some of these like sucrose, lactose, but then polysaccharides, which are signaling and recognition molecules. Nucleic acids are made up of four defined bases and they form structures like helices, double helix. And then lipids, there are about 40,000 chemically defined lipids they make up the membranes of, of cells. And so these molecules are either structurally or functionally important for cells. And in most cases, they have two uh, of these properties. They are either structural or functional, or they can be both. And it's that that we want to define in structural biology. So here is a typical animal cell on the right-hand side. About 3 billion of these will make up human uh, they're about 100 to 200 microns across, and they're quite complicated. There's lots of small, um, small um, subcellular compartments, and there's the nucleus here where the genetic information is, and here is the mitochondrion, which is the powerhouse of the cell. 
and they make up uh, higher life forms. And the membrane around there is a predominantly a lipid bilayer. For plant cells, they uh, have also complicated architecture inside, made up of all of these individual molecules of life. And the cell wall in this case is mainly carbohydrate, which gives uh, plants such as trees and so on, some kind of uh, structure. So how and why the four molecules of life work together is the aim of structural biology. <clears throat> so here we have uh, the atoms that make up these molecules. And all of these atoms are typically at around 0.12 to 0.2 nanometers apart. That's just chemistry. So a carbon-carbon bond is about uh, one to two nanometers long. So if we want to try and uh, find out the distance between these, we need a technique that is sensitive to that kind of distance range. And that is why diffraction has been used with wavelengths of typically X-rays, which is in this range, has been developed to determine the structure of these molecules of life. So diffraction has been a driving technology uh, in this case. But the challenge in biology is to manipulate the molecules into a suitable form for diffraction, and that's where sample preparation is crucial. I won't talk a lot about that, but it is something that takes a lot, lot of time, as any PhD graduate student will tell you. So how does diffraction arrive, the physical principles? Well, diffraction arises because the waves propagate through matter, and you can, there's lots of explanations for that, and such as x-rays or synchrotrons, um, or matter waves such as neutrons and electrons. And Bragg diffraction, as the waves go through a crystal uh, and are diffracted, they are bent, are defined by the very straightforward and simple relationship there are more complicated ones, but this is an easy way to understand it, where lambda is the wavelength of the waves that are impinging on the crystal, d is the distance between the planes, theta is the angle of the, free, the, of the diffracted wave, and m is just an integer known the order of diffraction. So if lambda here, the wavelength of the radiation, is similar to the distance between the atoms in the molecules, then the molecular structure can be defined from the diffraction pattern. And that's exactly what happens. So it's in reciprocal space. What we need to do then is to get back to real space so that the diffraction pattern gives us molecular structure. So here are some protein crystals. And the challenge is to get our purified molecule, a purified protein from a living material. And sometimes we have to adapt E. coli to make this. It's always fun for a physicist to get a, a cell or to get a bacterium to make a protein for them. And then make sure the molecule does what it should do. This is quite important. You have to characterize it. So for example, if this is an enzyme, you must make sure it does the correct reaction. Then you need to make it uh, into suitable, stable, homogeneous crystals, typically of a few millimeters in diameter for single crystal X-rays on a microfocus beam or a nanofocus beam. Nowadays, once a crystal is known to diffract, it can be mounted often and then sent to a synchrotron or an X-ray source, the data collected and analyzed remotely. You don't even have to go there. And here is one of those four, um, typical synchrotrons. This is one that's about 20 miles away from where I am now. It's a diamond light source. And here is a robotic mechanism where crystals can be sent from a lab to diamond. Then a robot will pick the crystal up and put it on a diffractometer and do all the analysis. It's all getting extremely um, automated these days. So here we are, we have a crystal, we have a diffraction pattern. This is a typical diffraction pattern from a, a protein. It's picked up here on a film, but normally it's now picked up on detectors. And because the raw data is in reciprocal space, the intensity and the position of the spot, we need Fourier transformation, again, which is fully automated these days, so that the end result is an electron density map. We're looking at the electrons from the atoms in the molecules in the crystal. And then the chemistry, in other words, the uh, sequence of the polymer protein here needs to be fit into the electron density. And what you produce is a molecular model. A molecular model is here. You can see some alpha helices and you can see some sheets in this particular example. 
That is kind of called a refinement process, and this is an iterative process where you can make it better and better as you get uh, a better model to try and fit the electron density. So, numerical analysis and simulation, which is run, as I said earlier, by classical mechanics in the simulation routines. So that is what structural uh, biologists who use diffraction do. So what happens next? Well, <laughs> the majority of these structures are determined and a lot less from DNA and lipids and carbohydrates, but they are usually put into something called the protein database. There's about 10,000 a year being put in. You can see this is the annual contribution, but the total is about 180,000 as of today. If it's really interesting and novel, then it appears on the front cover of journals such as Nature and Explanations. Here's a, a, a particular examples of some membrane proteins. And if you have really novel ones and you uh, get a, a, a world-class kind of response to your work, you might get the Nobel Prize for a new one. Why have we got so many structures? It's an interesting question, why we keep on determining structures. Why is it so important? Do we have enough already, for example? Well, all of your cells produce about 40,000 individual proteins. Of course, you need many more to function. And what happens is some of these have mutations, some of them are, are uh, changed in some way chemically, or they stick together with other complexes. But these small differences of mutations and changes in many living systems throughout life, uh, living uh, biology, means that there are many families of proteins all having a unique structure. That's why there are so many. One family has seven alpha helices. And in you, human beings, there are about 2,000 members of this family. They're actually the proteins that are involved in your senses, smell, sight, vision. And this is a typical example of one. And the second reason why we have so many structures is that um, when they function, they can change their shape. So they can go from one shape to another shape, and each of those shapes and structures has an individual form. And that means that we have an individual structure for each one of those. So one in protein in a database may have many different forms and many different structures. So the important thing is in understanding how the structure explains function. Let me give you two examples. In a living cell here, there are these mitochondria. I mentioned them earlier. They're the powerhouse of the cell. It makes this small molecule called ATP which drives all reactions in most living cells. How does that happen? How do we get ATP out of this cell uh, organelle, this mitochondrion, which then can function as the cell energy source? Well, the inner membrane of this uh, particular cell has got a cell membrane with lipids in like this, and there's a lot of protons, H plus particles this side, and not many this side. And those protons, we find they can go through the membrane, in particular through this large protein complex called an F0, F1 ATPase. So the proton flow through this part of the protein rotates, it's a molecular motor, it rotates much like a windmill or a turbine. As it rotates, it changes the structure of these comp components and ATP is generated internally there from the local interactions between these units. And the ATP molecules then are produced. And that is the way in which the proton flow through here electrically drives the motion of this particular molecular motor. So the proton gradient drives rotation and in turn produces ATP as an energy source. And all of these components were crystallized separately and then put together and modeled and fitted that took a very long time, but now we understand mainly how that works. And this man here got his uh, degree in chemistry in Oxford, got the Nobel Prize for that particular work and activity. Here's another example. As you are looking at the screen at this moment, light, photons of light are coming through your eye. They're hitting the retina at the back of the eye. And in the retina, there are photoreceptor cells. And the main protein in these cells, about 200 uh, microns across, is a protein called rhodopsin. This is one of those seven alpha helices proteins. 
Importantly, this protein is actually red if you uh, get it out of the eye and you look at it and it's because it's got retinol associated with it. So here is the retinol molecule. Retinol is actually the colored molecule found widely in things like carrots, tomatoes. It's actually vitamin A. When the light hits this molecule in the protein, it goes from a bent conformation, it so-called isomerizes through a shape change, into a straight conformation. And it gives this protein a different structure. So it has a structure in the dark and a structure in the light. So two structures. And in fact, the isomerization then causes uh, rhodopsin to go from a ground state R to R star. That R star now is activated. It's activated and it can interact with a lot of other proteins now where it couldn't interact with them before. And one R star, when a photon hits it like here, can interact with about a thousand of these transducin molecules. Every transducin molecule can interact with about a thousand of these here called phosphodiesterases, producing this small compound here. It's not unlike ATP. That shuts down this channel. And one photon shuts down a million channels. And as it shuts down the channel, the electrical properties of this change, and that sends an impulse through the optic nerve to the brain to give you an image. That is an amplification of one photon by 10 to the six events. That is 60 dBs, amp dBs amplification in about a microsecond. No man has made any photon capture device or any capture device which is as efficient as that. Biology is phenomenally efficient. And that's all come from putting together structural biology studies of rhodopsin and the biophysics. This is quantum biology. If you want any more about this, there's a lecture from me on the uh, Oxford University website. So there are lots of other methods for resolving molecular structure. Mass spectrometry you may know about. I've talked about the crystallography and diffraction. And uh, there are two others I just want to briefly mention because they are becoming very important now. One is cryo-electron microscopy and another one is magnetic resonance. So an electron microscope, many of you will know what they look like. A small amount of biological material, a few microliters is put on a grid, put inside, and the image is produced very often as single particles. This happens to be the single particles of a particular protein. By looking at tilted images, and these are tilted images, we can put them together to make up, again, electron density profile for this single particle of a protein. And it's a very good method for looking at complexes with many parts. Crystallography is better for individual parts, but this is a good way of putting them all together, like I showed for the F1, F0 ATPase. And here we're modeling in, again, it needs modeling into the electron density profile of the chemistry of the system. A topical example again, coronavirus. Here is a transmission electron microscopy image of a virus. Uh, here is a cartoon of that virus. And in particular, you can see how big it is, 0.1 of a micron, compared to a bacterium, and then compare the bacterium to the red blood cell, which is here. And you can see that you need masks or filters that can at least stop that going through if you're going to use um, masks to try and prevent transfer of the virus between individuals. From these micrographs and from chemical analysis and then reconstruction uh, techniques, it's been possible to reconstruct the model of such a virus. It's not unlike flu. It's got many of the same components, but the protein spikes here in green the carbohydrates are on the outside, which often complicate the system. There's a lipid membrane and they're nucleotides, so very similar molecules of life that we find in higher life forms, of course. And the vaccines today are being developed either to produce antibodies against the spike proteins or in to interfere with the ge genetic information from the uh, coronavirus. And biophysical studies are playing a vital role in this process. And just to show you, this is the protein database. I showed you 180,000 structures just since February of 2020. 
until April of 2020, these are the number of structures that have been deposited in the protein database from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that's how much biophysics is contributing at the moment to the COVID pandemic. And very briefly, lastly, nuclear magnetic resonance, a technique which is uh, used to look at the structure and resolve structure. You can see the number of structures coming from this methodology. And physicists have been absolutely instrumental in getting the um, technology to a level that it can be used in biology. Here we have Nobel Prize winners who developed the method for nuclear magnetic resonance. This is a theory and these are physicists. Richard Ernst here was the person who enabled the signal that you get out to be used and uh, produce structural information. He's from Switzerland and so is Kurt Vertrick and he got the Nobel Prize for using magnetic resonance to uh, resolve biological structures. And then Paul Latimer here and Sir Peter Mansfield, they both developed the technology for magnetic resonance imaging and the use in medicine. So magnetic resonance is a time-dependent method, so it's very good for looking at molecular dynamics. Nuclei, which have a magnetic moment, when you put them into a magnetic field, B0, can adopt different spin states depend uh, with and against the magnetic field separated by delta E. So delta E is the difference between the higher and the lower energy state, and they're proportional to B naught. There is a proportional uh, proportionality constant called the Bajara magnetic ratio. If we now change that equilibrium between the upper and lower energy levels by applying a weak pulse of radiation at mu, such that delta E equals H mu. So this is the frequency at which H, the Planck's constant, times delta uh, is equal to delta E. So it's exactly the same frequency. Then we can relax those spins down when we take off the pulse and we measure the signal that comes out during relaxation. So we disturb the equilibrium here. We allow it to come back to equilibrium here. And this is a time dependent signal which allows us to look at dynamics of the spins in the system. Fourier analysis will give us a spectrum of frequency against intensity, so it's a pseudo absorption spectroscopy look like, and we can resolve all of our information from these kinds of spectra. And these come from individual nuclei in the system. Delta E, the distance you, uh, between the upper and lower energy levels, depends on the shielding around the particle or the nucleus. It gives structure and also chemical environment. It gives dielectric and local charge. So we can get a lot of very detailed information about the atoms in our molecule from the NMR spectrum. For atomic nuclei, this is called nuclear magnetic resonance. Radio frequencies are usually used in the, in the kind of megahertz range. And then fields we use, need to do to use B0 are typically from two to 23 Tesla. An MRI machine is about four Tesla these days. For electrons, which have a very similar behavior, electron spin resonance, we use microwaves, which is about the frequency of your mo mobile phone, and between about 0.3 to 0.1 Tesla. ESR is about 2000 times more sensitive than NMR. But of course, we're only looking at electrons here, where here we can look at nuclei. In biological NMR, we need to be able to sure, see that the biomolecule has got detectable nuclei in it. Protons, of course, are natural abundance, so there's lots of protons that's frequently used. Carbon-12, which is the natural carbon nucleus, is invisible. It has no spin. And N14 is the natural abundance nucleus, but it's very low in sensitivity. So the most commonly used nuclei are actually protons, carbon-13 and N15. And most biomolecules can be labeled with C13 or N15. And you do that using E. coli and labeling technologies. In MRI, it's the relaxation of the, sorry, re relaxation of the proton in the water that is detected. And the contrasting signals that come from the MRI image 
are as a result of the relaxation or the motional properties of water in all of these different tissues. The NMR machine looks like this. The sample goes inside, superconducting magnet, and there's a console to pulse the radio frequency into that, and then out comes the NMR spectrum. So here is the spectrum frequency, usually normalized with respect to a reference against intensity. And if the protons in this case are around an aromatic benzene ring because of the electron delocalization, we get spectra in this region, whereas if they're in this kind of molecule for some amino acids, they're removed even more. So this can tell us what kind of environment our proton, our nucleus is in. So this gives local environment, but also gives us charge and chemical bond angles. And that's quite important because in a helix, they have a well-defined um, angles. And indeed, a qualitative analysis of a structure of a protein can be perform performed based on the NMR measured chemical shift differences of the backbone atoms compared to the unstructured residues. And here is an alpha helix, typically uh, shows a repeat of three point uh, 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 a repeat in the helix. And here is the beta stranded uh, characteristic. So these are fingerprints, if you like, for the alpha helix or beta strand. The line separations give us coupling to other spins, and that gives us structure, but also the intensity gives us the dynamics. So here is a two-dimensional spectrum now. It's possible to get three and four-dimensional spectra. And this is the coupling between H1 atoms in a protein and the N15, which have been labeled into a protein amino acids, and they're recorded in this 2D plot. And this now gives the structure detail, and here is a structure of a protein that typically comes from NMR. And normally we would get an ensemble of structures rather than a rigid structure. And proteins, I told you, move, so that is much more realistic uh, uh, for uh, a protein. And then computation analysis and molecular dynamics are also a major activity. So that's nuclear magnetic resonance. Crystallography needs crystals, no size limit based on the scattering of electrons and the R factor, but NMR is solution-based, so both methods have their advantages. And just to finish, the next talk will talk about visible and fluorescent spectroscopy in this kind of range, so with that I'll finish, and thank you very much. Okay. Yes, indeed, it's been really great yep. hearing all this music. Okay, I'll finish now. Oh. It's your turn, Manuel. You're mute. Okay. Steph, it's okay. Can you hear me? Everything okay? Okay, yes, thanks. Correct. Okay, so uh, I will go now into a bit of uh, specific examples. And I'm not really interested in the precise data that I will describe, but essentially to make some guided visit to applications from fluorescence and microscopy and uh, present these methodologies so you can appreciate the solid physics background that goes into it. So the first, that I, the first system that I will describe is uh, the so-called potassium channel and I will use uh, energy transfer for obtaining uh, structural information also. <clears throat> the channels already mentioned by Tony, here we have the channels. They are these beautiful proteins. They are inserted in the membrane. Here you can see in this cartoon, the, we have here the biological membrane. It's a bilayer with the lipids. And so we have these proteins. These proteins, they are fantastic in the way that they allow ions to go through them, and they are very selective. For instance, the one I'm going to talk, it allows potassium to go through the membrane, but it's going to block sodium. And uh, all the relevance from these systems comes uh, from uh, uh, disorders that happens, that happen, sorry, related to this, uh, uh, how these channels function. There are quite a lot of diseases, epilepsy, cystic, cystic fibrosis, etc. And the main aim is just to go to the situation of developing drugs. But we should know how the channel works. 
So the channel I'm going to tell you about is this one. It's a, is a potassium channel uh, with this name, K -K uh, CSA, and it is a tetramer. I mean, uh, here you already saw each monomer. It has these two helices. Tony already showed you the helices. These helices, they are here within the membrane. You see in the background, we have the biological membrane with the lipids. And in addition to these two helices, there is this very long tail. Okay. So there is a one lower gate here in this region for the ions, and there is here another gate. This other gate at the top that opens and or closes, it's called the selectivity filter, and it's something beautiful and very optimized. So for instance, allows potassium to go through, prevent sodium uh, and uh, ultra selective. And what we are going to study here, I'm going to show you information about here the selectivity filter, distances when they open and close. I will not go exactly to that detail, but we'll see how this can be studied. Also these channels, uh, they, uh, there are all these uh, uh, equilibria between closed and open states and people in electrophysiology, for instance, here, this is the conductive uh, uh, configuration you see the ions, they are going through the selectivity filter and the system goes to some inactivated situation where it closes, so distances, they are shorter. These are inactivation processes, very well known among electrophysiologists, and they happen in the time range of seconds. Let's, so to, let's go and study here the variations here just in the mouth of the channel. And this is the aim, obtain distances from this methodology, which is energy transfer. Briefly, for the physicists, this, this would not be a big surprise, but a, few, a beautiful phenomenon that uh, we can use uh, in, within the fluorescence methodologies is energy transfer. Here it goes. This is written such as a chemical reaction, but it's a pure physical interaction. We excite this molecule called the donor, so the small star, and it goes from the ground to the excited state. This molecule, if it is uh, the some vicinity, attention, is not in contact. It can be up to 100 angstroms apart. From some other molecule called the acceptor, it can transfer the energy from the donor to an acceptor. Uh, there is, uh, so uh, the reason for this is that we have interaction of dipoles. And if you go, for instance, into classic physics, we say that uh, the second molecule, it is within the radiation field of the first one. And so we have some kind of resonant interactions. Okay, uh, the, I should say, in fact, that the quantum mechanical uh, framework is much simpler than the classic one. Now let's uh, go to the important uh, uh, point is that the rate constant for this process to happen it has the usual inverse explicit distance uh, on the sixth power of the distance. So it's a very simple relationship. So if we determine a rate constants, we know distances. We can say, okay, donor and acceptor, they are 42 angstroms apart or whatever. The only condition for one of the requirements, I should say, for this to happen is that we should have some overlap between the emission of the so-called donor molecule and the absorption of the so-called acceptor molecule. Uh, physicists would say that we need some density of states for the resonant interaction to happen. The re final result is that we have a decrease here in the lifetime of this molecule and uh, we have eventually fluorescence from the second molecule. Now, there are two types of interaction related to energy transfer. One is that the so-called donor molecule and acceptor molecule, they are different chemical species. One can be a molecule con called the fluorescein and the other rhodamine, etc. In this case, energy goes from the first one to the second one. There is another possibility in case that one molecule, for instance, this molecule which is drawn here, it has some overlap between absorption and emission. We have the so-called density of states for a resonant transition. Okay, so one molecule of this, uh, one of these molecules, can transfer to uh, the energy to the second molecule, and certainly we can have also back transfer from the second to the first one. 
uh, one way of studying this specific type of energy transfer, which is called energy migration, is using polarized light or anisotropy, which is uh, similar. And uh, this happens since molecules they absorb light within very specific directions, the so-called transition moments. And in each act of transfer, uh, since molecules they are not strictly oriented, look at my fingers, it happens that we have loss of orientation, so it decreases the polarization. And this happens for the main fluorescent amino acid, which is called tryptophan. You have emission, fluorescence of tryptophan in green and, uh, uh, sorry, fluorescence of tryptophan in pink, absorption in green, we have here some overlap. So the forster, the forster distance is some kind of uh, uh, value, operational value for uh, quantify the type of interaction of a specific pair of molecules. Let's go now to our uh, potassium channel. In the potassium channel here, only two molecules, they are depicted, it's a tetramer. And within each monomer, there are how many tryptophanes? One, two, three, four, five. This is too much. Since we want a system, and later you understand why, with a very high symmetry, so we get rid of these four tryptophanes, one, two, three, four, that have the crosses, and we just left one this uh, last tryptophan. Get rid, it means that these uh, tryptophanes, they were replaced by another amino acid called phenylalanine. So we have this system with only one tryptophan per monomer, and this one tryptophan per monomer, it gives so this beautiful uh, geometry. So it's a square, as you see, when here we have one, two, three, four tryptophanes, one in each monomer. Now, what happens? When we excite one tryptophan, for instance, when we excite B, energy can flow to C, can come back, go to A, go to D. So here we have a redistribution of the excitation within this square. And for this specific geometry, we can derive here this equation that relates the variation of an isotropy uh, connected to the polarization of light with the rate constant. And such as I told you, once that we know the rate constant, it's very easy. From here, we determine exactly the distance. Just to, for giving some flavor, this is very simple for the students of physics, but derivation of equation, okay. We have this, uh, uh, we have this equation for the rate constant, uh, the, depending on the inverse sixth power of the distance. We describe the master equation that the master equation describes the survival and probability of the excitation, a matrix of rate constants. This has an exact solution. We determine the eigenvalues, etc. And here we arrive just to the beautiful equation. This is some other term I will not go into, the, uh, into detail related to the rotation of the old molecule. Here it is. On the top, we have experimental data. And over the experiment for three situations, this is for potassium, sodium, and some other ion. Uh, and here we have the data and we have the full lines. The full lines, they are a fit of that equation to the data. And in all cases, we got really a very nice uh, distribution of residuals. So excellent fits they are obtained. And now let's compare the distance that we obtain to the ones from X-ray diffraction. In pink, for different ions, sodium, rubidium, potassium, you have in pink the distances from X-ray and in black the distances that we obtain from uh, uh, homofret, from energy transfer. And the distances that we determine, they are shorter, much shorter as compared with the ones from X-ray. You can see that the associated error is very, very small in our methodology. So distances, they are different. Let's discuss them. And this is related to something specific already mentioned by Tony. But before that, I would, I would like to show you that uh, the, the distances that we recover, they are beautiful. One of the most beautiful things, and we play all the time with it, is, uh, well, fitting equations to the data. I already, saw, uh, already uh, showed you, sorry. Here's some experimental data and the residuals. Now, 
This is just the goodness of fit parameter, the chi-square represented versus the variation of the parameter. And it's very, very nice in the sense that we obtain very sharp parabolas. So the uncertainty of determination of the parameter is very small. The bad the story is that when we have very open parabolas, and so we determine the parameter with a very large uncertainty. And I will not show, but this was used to determine uh, distance in the channel in different situations of occupation and how, and also here it is the channel open, distances are larger and the channel closes, distances they are smaller. The main difference, one of the reasons for these uh, differences between X-ray and uh, uh, this uh, threat methodology uh, is that in fact, uh, st uh, the, we should get crystal, sorry, X-rays carried out in static situation. We are using crystals, they are not in solution. And also the big problem is already mentioned by Tony is just to obtain the crystals. And this is uh, one of the main problem. In this case, it was necessary to truncate the molecule, etc. I will just mention it. Uh, McKinnon's, uh, well, it was the Nobel Prize of 2003. He decided that he could not get good crystals. So somebody in the department told him, okay, there is too much dynamics here in these long days, cut them away. So he asked them, the there is ways of, in biochemistry to do it, they cut the tails. So the protein is certainly already not intact. In addition, the crystals, they were in some cases, uh, most cases bad. So they told that, okay, here in these loops here on the top or near the top of the membrane, there is too much dynamics, all this is moving. Use some antibodies. Uh, all of you know that antibodies are going to bite strongly to the protein. And when they bite strongly, they, they, uh, they reduce the dynamics. And so uh, they could obtain uh, beautiful crystals to go into the X-ray. So the protein in fact is, uh, uh, far away from the native, such as we say, from the native protein. Uh, and it's uh, beautiful also, you can, uh, you can get it from the, from the net. This is the Nobel lecture from Roderick McKinnon, and he describes that uh, the crystals, they were really Sorry, Esther, am I back in? Yes, you're back in. Everything okay. all right? Yes, there was here some loss of, uh, sorry, uh, net uh, here. Uh, and sorry, are you also looking to the projection is on? Okay, I, uh, right. I'm sharing it. Yes. There is no pre-ex right now. Sorry, I'm not, not, I'm not sharing it. No. Oh, moment. I'm very sorry. There was some disruption here in the net of the Institute. We are live. It's, it's all right. Sorry? But it's, it's all right. It's problems it's all right. that happen. But yes. sorry, I, uh, I, I'm sharing it or not? No. No. Not yet. No. Okay. I think that eventually the best it would be if I go out and come in again. Sorry for this. Not a problem. We'll wait for you. Yes. Uh... Oh, probably no need. Yes, Sorry. we can see it now. You can see it now. Okay, great. Yes. All great.
so sorry I was telling you that the X-ray is absolutely fantastic. By no means I want to just to say terrible things about it. Just making here the problem, uh, uh, emphasizing the problem of uh, working in solution and getting beautiful crystals. Uh, uh, okay, I had finished with this statement from Roderick McKinnon. And also it's funny since Gregory Weber, Gregory Weber, he was the founding father of biological fluorescence. And quite thoroughly, he has just made this statement. Indeed, the protein model resulting from the X-ray crystallographic observations is a platonic protein well removed in its perfection from the kicking and screaming stochastic molecule, etc. I emphasize myself that uh, without the information from X-ray, we could not really design this kind of experiment. Second, I will go quickly now with some information about with two other methodologies in this moment applied for, to the study of proteins and lipids. And I will use it to, to introduce you to two techniques related to dynamics. But before starting it briefly, as you know, there are the so-called amyloid fibers. So some proteins, they are very prone to make to aggregate even in solution and they give rise to these fibers. And these fibers, they are Parkinson, Alzheimer, and all the other neurological diseases. This happens for the protein, let's say, in water. But in the presence of the membrane, as you see here below, this process is really speeded up. So the membrane is going to catalyze. It acts as a template. So proteins in solution, they, uh, they uh, interact with the membrane and this is going to promote and speed up the formation of fibrils. So membranes, they are very important uh, just uh, to study in the framework of the formation of fibrils. Also, it was described that proteins which are not pathological, let's call non-amyloidogenic, they are not related to any disease such as uh, Alzheimer, Parkinson, etc. In the presence of negatively charged lipids, they can form fibers. And uh, I will show you how to determine the dynamics of this inter the extent of the interaction and the dynamics. So we have used this uh, very simple protein called lysozyme is taken from the egg white. We wanted some protein, we knew everything about it. And uh, we put some fluorescent molecule uh, in it called Alexa. And then uh, we have used membranes. These are the lipids that constitute the membranes with a small amount of negative lipid. So here it is, how we see the fibers under the microscope. These fibers, they have both lipid and protein. And uh, first uh, that I will show is a single molecule, well-established methodology for determining the interaction of the protein with the lipids and it's called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. And here it goes. It's a single molecule technique. Here under the microscope, we are uh, eliminating a very, very small volume. This is femtoliters. So if we have a very small concentration of uh, proteins, uh, this is in the nanomolar region, what happens is that some, we are going to have fluctuations of intensity. Sometimes we have no proteins there. When protein enters and fluoresces, then we can have two, zero. So we have this section of events, zero, one, two, three, two, zero, etc. And what we are going to do is a time correlation. We are going to correlate the intensity at time t with the intensity at uh, t plus tau, and tau is some delay. So. We are going here multiplying the interaction at time t and at time t plus tau. And as you can uh, see, this uh, describes in some case the memory of the system. Imagine that the protein is uh, very small or the medium is not viscous. The protein goes fast and if it is there at time t, it is no longer at time uh, t plus tau. If the diffusion is very slow or the protein very large, we can still find the protein immediately after. So the correlation function here shown, uh, G, describes exact, uh, translates in some way this memory of the system and correlation is lost at longer times. How to determine, we want to determine the amount of the protein which is in interaction, which is free 
and the amount of here you can see in this cartoon this would be the free protein and we uh, with the protein with a fraction of protein or the amount of protein which is interacting with the membranes which is here uh, shown the proteins attached to these vesicles the free protein diffuses very fast so in the correlation function we have this contribution of the free protein the protein attached to the vesicles we have this is controlled by the slow diffusion of the vesicles and we have a slow component and here it is we can determine the amount of free and bound protein from the theory of Russell's correlation spectroscopy the correlation function depend, depends on the square of the number of uh, fluorescing entities and, and also on the square of the brightness. Brightness is some kind of hill defined parameter, depends on uh, the quantum hill, the lenses of the microscope, etc. Uh, and uh, so, what happens is that if we know the fraction of bound protein, we can determine the precise parameter, the, the partitioned constant which describes how much the protein likes to interact with the membrane. Now, attention, this is very simple for the physicists, but the protein is distributed among the lipid vesicles according to a Poisson distribution, familiar to all of you. So in fact, we are going to have these uh, several species. We have the free protein, uh, which diffuses faster, we have vesicles with, with no protein. They are not represented here. They have no fluorescent molecule. We, thought, we do not see them. And then we have vesicles or membranes either with one, two or three proteins. This, uh, uh, well, the brightness scales as uh, uh, B, uh, B to B, three B, and uh, the amount of its species is given by the Poisson probability. So this is easy. Uh, we here we have the correlation function with the contribution from the fast moving free protein and the contribution from the vesicles, uh, the slow vesicles diffusion. We want to determine free and bound fractions, and they should be, they should be take, we should take into account Poisson distributions and all the statistics. So you cannot jump directly to the software of your microscope. And there are works which are wrong in the literature just due to this. Here it is the data. Here on the left, you see the correlation curve for the protein alone with no lipid, it goes fast. And from left to right, increasing the amount of lipid, it goes slower. And then on the right, we have the fractions of bound proteins. So in this way, we study the interaction of the protein with the membrane. Now, once that the protein is in the membrane, we want to determine how fast it moves, which are the diffusion coefficients. And here we'll go to some other uh, very simple process, as you will see, carried out under the microscope called fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. This process, it goes, this uh, technique, it goes like this. Here you have your membrane, let's consider which is flat, a two-dimensional system. And this is the, re the region of interest. And we have here fluorescent molecules all over the membrane. At time zero, we give a very short, in short pulse from the laser. This short pulse of the laser is going to photo bleach. Uh, it destroys the fluorescent molecules here, so the fluorescence intensity decreases. Immediately after, we uh, switch the laser to a low intensity to record fluorescence. And now, as time goes by, these molecules which are burned, they move away here. Fresh uh, mo fluorescent molecules, they go in, and we have a recovery of the fluorescence. And this is from this recovery of the fluorescence that you are going to appreciate the diffusion of the, of the molecules here in the membrane eventually. We cannot have a total recovery. This depends on specific properties of the membrane. I will not go into detail. Here it is again. Here we go, initial intensity. We burn the molecules at time zero and we appreciate the recovery. And well, this is simple. Here we have the solution for diffusion in two dimensions. We fit this to the data and we get this characteristic time from diffusion and from it, knowing the size of the pulse, we determine the diffusion coefficient. So the aim 
is to obtain here the diffusion coefficient. And here they are for this system. It was lysozyme, the very same protein with the membranes. In this case, we have used another dye. This is a very sensitive dye uh, which degrades quickly. We need it for our study. And this is the actual data. Here on the top, on up on the, uh, on the bottom. So the full lines, they are, this is the experimental data. And the full lines, again, they are the fit of the equation to the data. And the residuals, they are in, very, in all cases very nice. And let's just look here to this cartoon. Here we compare the diffusion coefficients that we obtain for the fibers with the diffusion coefficients which are obtained for uh, in a typical membrane. So the conclusion is that these fibers, they are extremely rigid and likely it happened. It also due to that the proteins, they are uh, just uh, in sandwiches in between the fibers. We obtain this information from another uh, source. And now for the physics students, just uh, the same thing which can be familiar to you. Something interesting is that sometimes these fibers, they have a bluish colors, even when there is uh, no fluorescent molecules there. This bluish color, it comes from interference, as we all know from physics, and this coherent scattering. And every time that we have uh, coherent scattering, we have interference and we can have color. So it's not either not related to absorption or fluorescence. And from optics, we know that this repeat distance should be about 100 nanometers. So also uh, to familiar to most of you in physics, but some other examples of coherent scattering, here they are. There are some beautiful butterflies, tropical butterflies with these blue colors. There are no molecules that are absorbing radiation. Is that the structure of the wings? It has a very small repeat distance and we have interference. Here on the right, this is something which is not familiar to the students of physics. This is a Neanderthal data storage system called the CD, where you can see here also the recent colors just to the very same. Bubble of soap, we have multi-layers with interference. And this is a spill of oil, of gas uh, over water. You can see sometimes on the road and the colors also, they come up from these multiple reflections. So eventually for these fibers, we think that the working model, they have a small repeat distance here and the fibers, they will be formed by these uh, cylinders that I show here. We obtain this information from some other methodologies. About uh, just to finish, I would just like to thank the collaborators. This was carried out, this is a song with a little help from my friends also from a Neanderthal pop group that the students of physics, they don't know, it's called the Beatles. And my friends, they are pictured within, I mean, uh, this comes from Sir Edward Elgar, go and see uh, the Enigma variations, he's not a pop star. And the co-authors uh, from Portugal, the, uh, the Ion Channel, it was in collaboration with Elche University in Spain. And thank you sir, for your attention. Okay, Esther, just finished. Yes, thank you very much for both of your presentations. They have been amazing and you have um, um, such illustrative examples. Also, thank you very much for showing us and helping us get a grasp on how being a biophysicist actually sort of feels like. And now we have about half an hour time for questions from the, the audience and the organization for both of you. So if you don't mind, I would begin to ask, yes, sorry. And this question goes for both of you, it's a bit personal. So what made you go into, the, into this interdisciplinary field, which, which is biophysics? Tony, okay. Sure. Um, it started for me at school. Um, I was very interested in biology and living systems, but I was also very interested in physics. And at that time in England, it was not possible to study either physics and biology together. Cambridge had a physics 
and natural sciences with mathematics and geology and many other subjects. But all of a sudden in England at the Leeds Bio, um, University, they initiated a course called biophysics. And I had the physics and the biology and chemistry and mathematics together. So I applied for the course and seven of us started the course, which was the, only the second year. The first year, only two students applied. Um, but within one year, five people had left my course and two were left and two of us went through the course. And I think one of the reasons was that the way they designed the course is we had to do an honours degree in physics, honours degree in chemistry, mathematics, bio, biochemistry, and then also some computer studies at that time, which in the 1960s was quite new. And it was really a big, a very big workload. That's why many people left, I think. But I stayed with it, so I enjoyed being a biophysicist. And then when I had finished I, my degree, I went to do a PhD in the same department. I'd already worked in the labs during the summer um, as an undergraduate. Enjoyed that so much. And then Manfred Eigen had started an institute in Germany in Göttingen um, called the Biophysical Chemistry Institute. And so I stayed on to do research there for five years uh, and then came to Oxford and have been here ever since 1980. So it really was from the age of 16, 17, I wanted to, to, to study biology and physics together. That was the way I got into it. Quite a new thing. Okay. Except my seat, my trajectory is still more well, yeah, funny, let's say. Myself, I graduated as a chemical engineer. In fact, I, no, I was not interested at all in chemical engineering. I never entered a chemical plant. It happened that this faculty, it has very good basic sciences. I mean, physics, mathematics, chemistry, etc. So uh, my PhD <laughs> was uh, about the photophysics and fluorescence and uh, with a bit of quantum chemistry. Okay, and then I started uh, interested in biological systems. At the very beginning, I was working in my cells. There was some fashion about my cells at the type, but uh, uh, I once went to a meeting in biophysics here in the nearby Spain, a place that you know, eventually Cáceres, and I saw, okay, I really like this. So this is my scientific family. I didn't know them. So I found the family. Uh, and uh, from then on, I picked up students with a background in biochemistry just to help me. Uh, and uh, in fact, at the faculty, I had uh, no, uh, uh, no uh, course or whatever in biochemistry. So I bought in the very beginning a, a textbook of biochemistry, which was popular at the time. And I started reading, oh, the protein so beautiful and the membranes and the DNA is so funny. And well, after things, they went really very nice and fast. And I had lots of fun and it's beautiful to work in biological problems. So since many years, I consider myself certainly a biophysicist. Okay. Wow, that's an inspiration. Thank you very much for sharing. So do you have any, any sort of advice for people like me that are studying physics? As you know, this seminar is mostly going to be seen by physicists that want to dive into the world of biology. Like wh how or which kind of paths do they follow to incorporate a bit more of bi biology? Hmm. Tony, well, <laughs> well, uh, Stel, sorry, your question is for the people who is in physics, how to approach biology, let's say, to be the question in some way. Yes, yeah, if you yes. think also there are some degrees at bachelor levels that should be included or anything you know. Uh, first, uh, uh, Tony already mentioned, and he will go around with it. What I am going to say is that it's very easy, in the sense that in ph physicists, you have really a quantitative knowledge, and you know the mathematics, you know the approaches, etc. So, to go into biology from physics, and very recently, I have here students of physics coming from abroad, here in the lab, 
the last one was from Brazil, a fantastic guy. But coming from physics to biology is very simple. And to learn biology, you will do it very quickly. Uh, and you learn it with biochemists also, certainly. Uh, so the reverse approach, I mean, going to biology, into biophysics, it's really much tough in the sense that you do not have really the good foundations. So uh, my opinion is that people, we should get uh, uh, good basic formation in the basic sciences. This is mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology. And after going into biology, you will have really no problems. And uh, uh, Tony, I will leave it to you. You also design how the trajectory could be. Yes, it, it's an interesting transition when people come from physics into biology or into biophysics. Physics is very quantitative. It can be very precise at every level. OK, we have uncertainty principles where things are neither one thing or the other, perhaps. But biology is very messy. It's very different. and as long as one can understand that biology is messy and it's not highly quantitative and there are population differences and so on, as one understands that, I think, think it's, it's quite easy to cope with biology. But the, you're right, Manuel, the physicists do have a quantitative fixed outlook and it's a lot easier to go that way oh, sometimes absolutely. than from biologists to come into the physics. The chemistry, you can pick it up because it, it, it's not difficult. It's mm -hmm. a bit like physics, chemistry, like maths. It's all very precise. But interfacing and encompassing the biology, with this, which is messy, is, 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 is always quite interesting. I always find it quite fascinating, the biology of systems. And I knew it had to be driven by the laws of physics, as it always does, of course. Um, but I, I, I think that transition is probably easier to make. And I find it fascinating, especially when I take physics undergraduates, they come to do PhDs, and to see them produce a protein by expression from a cell or to purify a protein or to extract something from biology, it really is very satisfying. I think it's, it's better than twiddling knobs on resistors and electrical circuits and computation. So there's a lot of fascination in biology and it's unending. There's so many problems that can do. It's indeed a beautiful science. And I've also noticed when you were talking about your history is that there's a lot more of field work, I believe, in, in biology, like going activist hunting and all sorts of anecdotes that don't happen in, in physics. But... Sometimes you have to go and get your material. You have to go and get eyes from a squid, for example, or you have to go and get it from live material or get some plants. And the first lipids I ever used in my research, I got some eggs from the local grocery and smashed them and I purified the lipids from them. That's how you did work in those days or took a cabbage and extracted an enzyme from it. That's how you did it. That's not too long ago. <laughs> Most of the cases is there you collaborate with biochemists. So uh, obtention materials, for instance, in that story that I described, replace one amino acids by the others, that's molecular biology. And people in biophysics, we are doing it, but uh, you can collaborate with chemists and it's very easy. I mean, one, one interesting point is semantics, mm -hmm. the language you speak. And I often have to change the language, the way you describe something to a physicist is different to how you describe it to a biologist or to a chemist. And, and that is a talent, which I think biophysicists do have. Mm -hmm. Biophysicists can talk to many different disciplines. And that, that's, a, that's an important point, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, so we would like to know, how did you get involved with the IUPAP, you know, your, your institution? Like, is there a history oh, yeah. behind? Okay, so uh, this is uh, a, a fairly standard progression. I was involved with, as an undergraduate, and then as a PhD student, I went to British Biophysical Society meetings in the UK. I was invited to give talks and talked about my work. And then um, I went to work in Europe, so I interacted with a lot of uh, colleagues in Europe, came back to England again, and again was on the committee for the British Biophysical Society, 
they needed to be represented at the European level, but I was invited to be managing editor of the European Biophysics Journal, and that got me into the European Biophysics Association, uh, where I also met Manuel, which was very, very nice. And then at the U European level, of course, I was also going to the American Biophysical Society, where you meet people from all over the world, 45% are non-Americans at that big annual meeting. And then I was asked more recently to become involved with IUPAB, the international, the top level biophysical association. So I've been doing this now for um, since 1969. So I've been around a while in these different places. And it's very nice. The communities that you deal with are people who are passionate about the science, passionate about biophysics and cooperate at a really nice uh, cooperative level. And it's a community that's not so huge that you do know quite a lot of people in it. Unlike some big societies where there's hundreds of thousands of members and you may only see someone once in your lifetime, but here we see people quite regularly. And it's, it, it's a community. It has a good community spirit to it. So that's why I enjoy working with it. My soft there was also step by step. So uh when i discovered that uh, the my uh field was biophysics I, i've been involved just in the foundation of the portuguese biophysical society did not exist it at the time after i got involved where uh, i met also tony within uh, the european uh, federation of societies that's where uh, it was there that i really learned the most about uh, organization in science, definitely. Uh, and uh, then I went into uh, IUPAB after it. So it was uh, some natural progression. All right. And uh, now, uh, just, sorry, sorry? Just, no, such as Tony mentioned is one of the uh, uh, great, great uh, real stories is this possibility if we know the correct background, if you know the physics principles, etc., just pick up new subjects. Uh, in the very beginning, I was uh, just talking <laughs> enthusiastic about uh, what I started two weeks ago about uh, the lipids in the eye and things like that, that uh, certainly they are brand new to my story. So opening the new fields is also lots of fun, really. Keep on so And from you, what's from what you said, the proposition to be a IAPS for students. Right now, do you have any current space subsection or activities that are directed towards students or young scientists? Besides? So, so there we cannot, we IOPAB, we can address the executive committee of APS and make these proposals uh, correct, is just what we think. Of course. No, okay. I was wondering if right now do you have any activities for the young members of, your, of, the, of this community? So I, I might add that there are a number of workshops that take place across the world um, associated with IUPAB and the other biophysical organizations and these are very good places that to start to understand and learn about biophysics and people from physics come to these as well as well as chemistry um, small workshops with 30 or 40 people in all young people being taught by experts from around the world and usually in nice locations and sometimes you can get support to go travel support um, so this is, is, is an activity which goes on and you should look at the IUPAB website and the other biophysical organizations, look at their websites for workshops. Of course, at the moment, we're slightly closed down because of COVID, but these will open up again and your members would be extremely welcome at these kind of workshops. They, they would very much be welcome to, to come along to these and start to build up a relationship with other students, Absolutely. other people in the areas, and in particular, the PIs, the, the tutors, the experts, they will want you to, the reason we teach at these is so that young people can come to our lab. We can see 50 people and maybe 20 of them would like to look for a PhD or look for a postdoc. And this is why we do it for free always. Um, mm -hmm. But we want to interact with young people. That's where the new ideas will come from. Absolutely. That's why we want. I agree. So it sounds great. So the last question I would like to ask you 
is there any advice that you would like to give to young people interested in biophysics? Uh, advice for starting up, uh, contact a biophysicist. Uh, it would be <laughs> the very first one and uh, go to some workshop with some kind of tutorial approach, such as Tony mentioned. This would be the, and certainly the two things they, they would hap can happen together. Uh, this would be one hypothesis. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, there are by now some uh, type of articles written for uh, science, I would not say science divulgation, but uh, something at a higher level, uh, which uh, can be interesting for uh, uh, a student of, of physics uh, just to read such of, for instance, in that uh, initial approach, uh, initial description of the fields of action of biophysics that Tony mentioned, there are uh, uh, papers uh, describing the field and they can be interesting. So going ahead with this literature at some uh, divulgation level and uh, uh, meet people and go to a place all together. So for undergraduates, I would recommend, and this, this does happen, that if you're in a physics department, just open your eyes a little and see what is happening in, say, a chemistry or a biochemistry oh, okay. or a mathematics department. Absolutely. Have a look at the seminars that are happening in those places. And every university opens anybody to their seminars and so on. And just go and sit in the back of the seminar in an area that you think you know nothing about and just pick up the interest that is there. So. We certainly invite anybody from other departments into our weekly seminars when they happen. Um, and that way you will start to open up your mind. And then if you're a graduate student, you have a problem, go and talk to somebody, another graduate in a chemistry department or a maths department, if you have a numerical problem. Um, I can give you one very good example of where that happens. Single particle tracking is now a big business. People are doing this a lot. And the kind of software that is being used for single particle tracking was orig originated from following planets and heavenly um, bodies, uh, asteroids and comets. And the same kind of technology has now found its way into biology simply because some students went between astronomy and, and, and uh, bi biochemistry as it happened. So there are many examples like that. So open your mind, be open to other ideas and talk to other people and see how they would approach the problem. And it's interesting what new ideas you can find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's indeed really good piece of that advice. And I agree that the interdisciplinary nature of biophysics allows for so, so much advance and so many groundbreaking discoveries, like really looking forward. That's right, cross so boundaries, cross boundaries, it's very important. Okay, absolutely. Cross boundaries. That's it. Completely agree. So I can't stress now how thankful we are that you agreed to give such a spectacular talk to us. Again, thank you very much. Thank you for leaving. Would you like to give any final statements? Thank you very much for inviting thank us you. and being such good hosts. And I hope that we have some response and I hope you enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure. Yes, the very same. Thank you so much, really. In the greatest pleasure, and I must say, you both are a great inspiration for all young physicists and scientists that are okay. out there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.